in this next to the last segment, we're going to talk about industry favorability. It turns out some industries are more favorable than others for startups. Because of the nature of the market dynamics we were describing before and the technology that is being developed, as well as the entrepreneurial intensity in the current companies that exist, how much innovation is happening in individual companies, uh, inside the companies versus that are, is necessary in the marketplace, different types of opportunities are better for small startups to try to address and others are better for larger companies to address. So what you want to do when you're thinking about uh, building your company is not only does the idea have to be good, it's sustainable and you understand that you're solving someone's problem and you're jumping in there. You also have to ask yourselves, is this the kind of business that if I go in as a small company, I'm likely to be able to, be able to succeed. And there's not big companies out there that are going to rush in and try to take this business, uh, this marketplace away from it once uh, from me, once I do the hard work of proving that there's a business model there that works. So what are some of the things that favor startups versus incumbents? Generally, we think of companies that are capital intensive or opportunities that are capital intensive, like building a large property or, or having access to lots of resources, advertising resources or the like, uh, existing customer base, uh, distribution warehouses, those kinds of things. If that's necessary, then you tend to have difficulty entering as a startup. Telecommunications, for example, you need a huge network, a network infrastructure, assets, whereas software, you need smart people that write code. So software tends to be a more favored industry for startups. The same is true with in the industry sector, you need a large energy plant, you know, a power plant. That's assets. That's hard to get into that business. Whereas someone who comes up with new ideas about how to do software or perhaps how to do service in the the industry engineering, for example, that's a good area for startups because it's knowledge focused, it's individual human beings. If you get a good group of people, you can add real value, even in a large operation like an energy, the energy sector. Uh, semiconductor fabrication, typically you need billions of dollars to open a new fab facility that has the economies of scale. But designing a new microprocessor with engineers, that's something you can do again with some smart people. That's the sort of place you start a business in that arena. In fact, when there's an opportunity, one also wants to frame how you would approach that opportunity as being in the knowledge intensive arena as a startup and then potentially expand more broadly as you get larger into the assets as you have access to financial resources. In addition, you have situations in a related way between economies of scale versus linear cost. If having a huge factory allows you to generate one more new kind of car or new kind of, of widget or chip that is a little bit different, but you don't have to pay for putting all the assets in place, that's something that favors an existing company. However, if the costs are more linear, like for example, there aren't no, no economies of scale, again, similar to knowledge, you, you cost the big guy just as much as it costs you to create this new product or service. That's another signal that you're in a startup, you have a better chance of being successful in the longer term. Large scale manufacturing versus software or games is an example of that. Unless you have, as the gaming industry has gotten bigger, there's underlying assets that you need in order to, you know, different kinds of, uh, of processing power and different kinds of skills and modules that you need. So that starts to move a little bit more towards large scale manufacturing. But still, this, the idea is still pretty much the same. Traditional retail versus internet retail. Traditional retail, you need a store, you need facilities, you need to pay your releases or rents or whatever. Internet, you basically open a website. The more linear, the more cost you have, the more you have to pay. These are the sorts of things that favor a startup or a, a capital intensive or an existing player. Concentrated markets versus fragmented markets. <laughs> Concentrated means that you have a large number of, or there used to be a small number of very large players in the marketplace. Uh, lawn equipment manufacturing, for example, versus lawn care service, uh, one is very concentrated, the other is fragmented. The lawn care people working in New Jersey different than Long Island, different than in, 
the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and that's different than what's happening in the Philadelphia area or whatever. Commercial banking, generally concentrated, but real estate and sales is fragmented. It exists around where the, where the homes are. So let's look at that analysis of how dynamics of a particular industry impact whether a startup or an incumbent has advantage and talk about situations where the advantage is with the incumbent. When you're far down the learning curve, meaning the products and services that are generally being brought out by the companies in the field have been around a long time, all the learning or much of the learning is already done, the next product that comes out is, the, is built on top of prior products and knowledge about how to build those products and services, those tend to favor incumbents. Uh, coming out with a new model of an automobile would tend to favor incumbents. Uh, one could argue that because it, one of the reasons the Tesla has a lot of operating problems is because the existing players in the field have learned a lot of these things about how to build cars, and it's very difficult for a company like Tesla to start in that environment, which fortunately for them, they're hugely capitalized so they can make mistakes, but that's the whole point. They have to make a lot of mistakes to get as far down the learning curve as existing players. So incumbents tend to have the advantage when the business or the products or the services in the industry that are creating these the existing products and the opportunities are kind of incremental to them, uh, they tend to have an advantage. Even if you're able to come up with a new product idea, they can simply add that as a feature function on another product and then move forward at a lower price point than you can as a new startup. That is related to the economics of marginal cost pricing versus total cost pricing. If I already have a huge facility and I'm building one more product, I only have to make incremental profit at, on the margin for that product because so many of my other products that I'm selling are paying for all the assets. Whereas if I'm a startup and I need specialized equipment like specialized machining or specialized uh, software or hardware, I have to put all that in place and essentially pay the cost of all that capital just on the products that I'm building. So I'm paying total cost for my pricing. I have to recover all of that in my pricing, whereas my competitors only have to pay, only have to ju justify incremental products being sold on top of their huge asset base. Or if they already have a brand, they only have to sell another product that's a brand extension, whereas me, I have to build my whole brand and I have to build my whole uh, product base and make back my pricing on that, uh, make back all those costs on my pricing. So that's another example of how the dynamics of an industry actually have brought, have costs on, they, they actually have impact on the cost structure and therefore on your ability to make back the costs associated with generating your product because typically you have to buy, go with premium pricing. Reputation in this context is a key thing. If reputation is really an important element of your of your product or sales, like for example, you're doing some sort of security software, then your reputation for your company needs to also justify somebody trusting you that your product will actually work. So reputation is another type of asset. If the if there's a safety concern, then the reputation, you have to build a reputation for your product, whereas other existing incumbents already have that reputation. So that operates in a, in a way as a type of embedded cost that is marginally, people have already built it, so they only have to sell products and they get the benefit of that reputation. Whereas as a startup, you have to build all of that on your own. These are the things that you have to think about when you're structuring your business to address the opportunity you see. How do you maximize your advantage versus existing players? So now let's look at the advantages that we have as startups. So how does someone find not only a business opportunity that you can develop as an entrepreneur, but also one that favors you as a startup over the existing players in the field? It boils down to generally a few things. As you remember, Schumpeter talked about the creative destruction. That's another term for that is competence destroying change. The way things used to work don't work anymore. So all the people that knew how to do that, they no longer have 
of an advantage over you. You want something where people are learning and figuring out how to solve it, how to solve the problem, how to work with social media, how to integrate gaming into business or work. How do you do all of those things? No one's figured it out before. New stuff, competence destroying change, that's called. Generally, there's an old market, and in order for a new company or an existing company to go after this changing world, they have to actually accelerate the change, which hurts their old business. That's called cannibalizing their own markets. Another thing that is good is if you have a discrete product, something that's sold, it solves a particular discrete problem, and it's better and it's better than, than anything else out there. For example, a charger that works with all the Apple equipment. That's the kind of discrete product and service. It's much harder to just improve something that Apple is selling because Apple has to be your partner to put that in place. And they don't have a lot of motivation to make you successful. They want to make themselves successful and try to figure out a relationship that will do that for them. So you want to sell something that you can sell end to end, your product, your service. People buy it from you. And that's a discrete product or service. You can sell it through distribution channels. You need distribution partners, but you don't want your product to depend upon some other competitor to, to go along with something that you want. For example, coming up with a new type of windshield wiper, which somebody did at one point, no one would buy it. Why? Because they didn't see any reason why they wanted you to change all the processes they already in place. They'd rather just wait and see. You remember that? conservative organizations. And then human capital, you want that to create the value. It's usually knowledge, design, creativity, those kinds of things. A new YouTube channel is filled with creativity and individuality. That's something that is human being, human capital creating the value, not physical assets. Those are the kinds of things that you want to be thinking about, for looking for that favor you as a startup.